My name is James Milner, and I want to talk to you this evening about refugees. Now, refugees, it's a hot topic. It's a big button issue these days, not only in Canada, but in countries around the world. We seem to get quite preoccupied with the issue of refugees, and especially refugee numbers. So let's start with numbers. Let's start with this number, 22,500. In the year 2010, 22,500 individuals came to Canada and sought asylum. They asked to be recognized as refugees here in this country. Now, some people say that's a big number. That's a really big number. And that indicates for a number of people that maybe there are too many people trying to come to Canada to become refugees here. But if that's a big number, let's look at this one, 51,000. In the year 2010, there were 51,000 cases waiting for an answer from the Canadian system on whether or not they were going to be recognized as refugees. This is what's called a backlog. 51,000 people waiting, waiting for an answer. And the size of this backlog, some people say, eclipses the number of 22,500 and has motivated calls for reform, reform to our system to make it faster and more efficient. But if 51,000 is a big number, what about this one? 15.4 million. At the end of 2010, the United Nations tells us that there were 15.4 million refugees in the world. That is the global refugee problem. And when you look at a number like 15.4 million, it helps keep 22,500 in perspective. But if there's one number that I want you to remember this evening, it's this. 18. Very small number. Why 18? It takes on average 18 years to resolve a refugee situation. That means that on average, refugees spend 18 years in exile. 18 years. But where do they spend those 18 years? Very few refugees ever make it to countries like Canada, the United States, to Europe, or to Australia. In fact, 80% of the world's refugees remain in the global south, in developing countries. They remain in countries like Pakistan, like Syria, like Kenya, like Tanzania. And these countries themselves face significant challenges of poverty, of growth, of stability, and security. 80% of the world's refugees spend 18 years waiting for a solution in these countries. And this is typically where they wait, in a refugee camp. When we think of refugees, this is the kind of image that frequently comes to mind, of refugees arriving, in this case, into Kenya. They're arriving from Somalia. And this is one of the three camps near the town of Dadaab in northern Kenya. This refugee camp has been there for 20 years. And it continues to receive new arrivals from the drought and the lack of governance in Somalia. Three camps near the town of Dadaab were originally built to accommodate 90,000 people. Today, these camps accommodate 490,000 people waiting, waiting for a solution. Now, the problem of refugees or the challenge of finding protection for refugees, a solution to their plight, is not new. And for more than 60 years, we've had this United Nations agency, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. They were given a mandate to do two seemingly simple things, to ensure the protection of refugees and to find a solution to their plight. But the work of UNHCR is getting harder, not easier. In 1993, it took on average nine years to resolve a refugee situation. Today, it's 18 years. But the logic has never really changed. In 1951, the countries of the world came together and they signed a convention. This set out the rules on how we were going to ensure the protection of the world's refugees. And in legal language, they essentially said, the problem of refugees is a global problem. And the only way that we can find a solution to this problem is not through isolation. 
is not by pulling up the drawbridges and sharpening the swords. The way to find a solution for refugees is through cooperation, collaboration, and integration. And this logic has not changed. This objective has not changed. What has changed has been our approach. For the last 20 years, have we adopted a, an approach of collaboration and integration for refugees? No. This has been our approach. We've taken the issue of refugees and we've put it in a silo. We said we're going to look at refugees strictly as a humanitarian challenge. And it is a humanitarian challenge, but it's much more than that. What they've said is we're going to take the question of refugees, we're going to put it in a silo. We're going to put refugees in camps and we're going to keep them there until we can find a solution. And it's in these camps that refugees wait and wait and wait for 18 years. What we have to do is take the issue of refugees out of its silo and integrate it into everything else that we do. Now the good news is we have done it before and we can do it again. Some of you may remember uh, these images from about 40 years ago. In 1975, there was a series of events in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia that eventually led to three million people fleeing those countries and becoming refugees. Three million people fled, often in these small, rickety boats. They were attacked by pirates. They fell victim to different kinds of abuses. And when they arrived in places like Malaysia, or Hong Kong, or Thailand, the international community responded as we normally do. We set up refugee camps. But very quickly we realized that this approach of camps was not going to work. The scale of the problem was simply too big. And something else very important happened. People like you and me, we saw these pictures. We saw the pictures of human suffering. We saw the photos of the shortcomings of our approach. Members of the public, leaders in civil society, we demanded a new approach. We said to our leaders, we have to find a solution for this problem. And so what did we do? We integrated the needs of refugees. We integrated solutions for refugees into regional relations, into dialogue, into peace building, into progressive approaches of finding solutions, not keeping refugees in a silo, but finding ways of integrating refugees in an approach to find solutions. As a result, almost two million refugees were resettled to places like Canada, the United States, Australia, and elsewhere. And solutions for another million refugees were found through cooperative, collaborative, and comprehensive approaches. This is the kind of creative thinking and integrative thinking that we need today. And we can do it in at least three ways. The first is to take the issue of refugees out of the humanitarian silo and integrate our work on refugees into the work that we do around the world in peace building. In places like Burundi, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, we are engaged in activities to consolidate peace and prevent a slide back to war. And often, there are large displaced populations, large refugee populations, that are connected to these conflicts in very complex ways. Let me tell you very briefly about my time in Burundi in 2009. There have been refugees from Burundi living in Tanzania since 1972. And as a result of peace in Burundi, some of these refugees decided to go home. Between 2002 and 2009, half a million refugees returned to Burundi. That meant that 6%, 6% of Burundi's entire population were returned refugees. Many of them had no access to land. They had nowhere to go. And this displaced population created a challenge for those trying to build peace. And so what did they do? They didn't have refugees in a neat humanitarian silo. They integrated solutions for refugees into peace building, reconciliation, development, 
and the provision of services. They started building villages, not just for returned refugees, but for other displaced populations, for other vulnerable populations, for other war-affected populations. And so conceptually and practically and physically, refugees ceased to be part of the problem and they became part of the solution. We can do the same thing when we talk about development. This is a wonderful photograph and I, I encourage that you uh, follow the link on the slide to the blog that's kept by a group of refugees from South Sudan who spent decades in the Kakuma refugee camp in northern Kenya. It's a graduation photograph in 2009 where a number of refugees graduated from training as teachers, as health workers, as development practitioners. They used their time in exile to acquire new skills that they could contribute when they returned to South Sudan, a country recovering from more than three decades of war. Using the opportunity of exile, engaging with refugee populations, encouraging self-reliance, finding ways of getting training to refugees so that they can equip themselves to be agents of change. And that's really the key message. When you visit refugee camps from Thailand to Tanzania, this myth of refugees sitting passively with their hands out waiting for a donation is shattered. When you see the economic activity, the entrepreneurial spirit, the determination, the will of these people waiting for a solution, setting up market stalls, setting up a bicycle repair stand, a hairdressing salon, a tailoring shop. There is a human capital that is locked up in these dozens of refugee camps around the world that is waiting to be liberated. Refugees are not the problem. We need to make refugees part of the solution. And so if we go back to that image that we had before of the Dadaab refugee camps, I want you to look at it again. Who is working in these camps to set up the tents for the new arrivals? Is it Western aid workers with their UN helmets and bibs? No, it's refugees themselves. Some of these refugees who have been in the camp for 20 years, they are the ones who are working to find solutions for the new arrivals. So let me leave you with this. We have done it before and we must do it again. This is a group of young people that I met in southern Burundi in 2009. Their parents had been refugees in Tanzania since 1972. They were born in exile. They returned to a country that they never knew. And they have a long road ahead of them to ensure that their solution is durable. But they're the lucky ones. They're on the road to a solution. There are 15 0.4 million refugees in the world. 80% of them do not make it to countries like Canada, the United States, Europe, or Australia. They spend an average of 18 years in exile. But now we know. They're typically hidden from the headlines. But now we know. And now we can demand action. That we take refugees out of the humanitarian silo. That we no longer just keep refugees in camps that we engage with refugees as part of the solution. We have done it before, and we must do it again. Refugees spend an average of 18 years waiting for a solution. I think they've waited long enough. Thank you.